Okay, so today I am here with my friend Alice, who is an intersex person and also an artist who bends literal gas to her will. So you make neon sculptures? That's what I have started getting into lately. Uh, it's a lot of fun, you work with really hot fire. Uh, is it dangerous? It is very dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> so we've actually gathered here today to talk about intersex and health. Being intersex in and of itself is not a disorder, right? That's what the intersex movement yeah. is saying. And yeah. we know that to be true. And simultaneously, there are many intersex traits that come with sort of concurrent symptoms or considerations that you might have to medically manage. Yeah, absolutely. We're here today to talk a little bit about our own experiences, and of course, disclaimer, we're not doctors. I play a doctor on YouTube. This is not medical advice, and especially in light of coronavirus, we're trying to be careful, and that is why we're shooting our first ever remote episode. We've both, as intersex people, obviously had healthcare experiences, and we can like grimace at that. Are there any like health considerations that you have to take into account with your particular intersex variation. So I know you talk sometimes a little bit about chimerism and what that means. Being a chimera is when you, as a person, have in your body two or more distinct sets of fertilized full sets of DNA. It has to be a fusion of two uh, fertilized embryos. Um, and that happens in the womb, in utero. So I like to say that I'm two tiny dykes stacked up on top of each other wearing a trench coat. <laughs> and uh, every time you say that, I smile. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, but uh, I, I used to say that because I was really tall, but when I uh, figured out I was a chimera, it kind of added irony to the, um, to the saying. But um, I actually have a twin sister, but we were, for a short time, triplets. Whoa. And yeah, the so, other two embryos formed to make me. So you absorbed another embryo. Yeah, well, actually, I, I don't know how to think about it because if I was the egg that got, that absorbed the other one, I would technically be both, so I would also be the embryo that got absorbed. So isn't that me also me? Like, I, I, I don't know. This, this it, is getting extremely it, meta. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's get, it's hard, it's starting to hurt my head a little bit. Right. Well, so as, with that, so that means that some of the cells in your body might have different chromosomes. So maybe like some of them are the same and some of them are different. Like, are there health yeah. things that you have to consider with that? Well, I know that like at least for me, uh, I have some immune problems, and the I guess the theory behind that is that when you have two distinct sets of cells with different chromosomes, sometimes they like recognize each other as foreign entities. They're like that Spider-Man meme where they're like, po it's like he's pointing at himself um, <laughs> and he's like, hey, you're not supposed to be here. And I know I've heard that from a couple of other friends who have that same intersex variation. And actually our friend Robin probably knows a lot about this. Oh yeah, uh, let me call them, hold on. Hey. Hey y'all, what's up? Can you tell us about being intersex and immunocompromised? Oh, sure, I've got some time, yeah. So certain intersex people are also immunocompromised. Chimeras, whose bodies may frequently recognize their own cells as foreign tissue, those of us put through unconsensual medical procedures, or taking a myriad of, of med medications, could all be affected by not participating in social distancing right now. Another thing to keep in mind is that trauma is capable of weakening the immune response in all of us. A study done by Columbia University New York revealed altered methylation in the DNA of PTSD patients of genes that were all connected to neural and immune function. Oh. This would mean that those of us predisposed to certain traumas people of color, LGBTQIA folks, people with disabilities or low socioeconomic status, could all be affected greater because of that trauma. Oh, wow. Yeah. Totally. Stay safe, friends. Thanks, Robin. Yeah, I mean, they're right. It 
is important, what everyone's doing right now with social distancing, especially for folks who are immunocompromised, whether that comes from being intersex or not. Yeah. Kind of just before all the COVID stuff hit, I was going through my own process dealing with bone stuff. So if your body doesn't make sex hormones, like if your organs that were producing those hormones were either removed or you never had them in the first place, so no estrogen, no testosterone, that affects a lot of other parts of your body. I never had, you know, anything that would have made estrogen in the first place, but some intersex people, they have that consideration because their gonads were surgically taken from them, sometimes in infancy before, um, before they really could know what was going on. But I think you and I talked about this a little bit before, where like, you want to stay on top of your bones, and I just recently had what was called a DEXA scan to measure like how dense your bones are and if they're um, heading towards osteoporosis or not. And yeah, I tested in the bottom fourth percentile for bones, so that means that I am in the worst four percent of bone havers, unfortunately. Oh no. It, I have many other redeeming qualities, but you know, it's important now to just like take more estrogen, do more calcium, vitamin D. I'm going through that process to figure out how I can maybe not have osteopenia in my 20s. Um, I'm already there, but that is, I think, a side effect that a lot of intersex people deal with. Uh, I feel like I have kind of had some experiences where you, uh, when I, when I go to, for instance, the doctor, uh, and I'm mm -hmm. filling out a form, uh, mm -hmm. and they ask for the sex, and it says male or female, each of those sex identifiers has certain things that are associated with it that may be important for a physician to know that are not necessarily going to be associated with someone who has an intersex variation. Because I've, I've crossed out once, um, I, I crossed out the male and female thing and put intersex and the doctor was like, so what do we call you? And I was like, but is that what you're asking? Because Right, well it's different than gender think... identity, right? Like I, in a perfect yeah, world, we would all be, you know, gender inclusive form design experts. It's more of an issue of, um, if you're going to ask for my pronouns, then ask that. Um, mm -hmm. If you're asking what my, what genitals I have, Ask that if you're asking if I have certain gonads, ask that, like, because those mm -hmm. are the things that um, certain physicians need to know, right? Right. I mean, yeah, I've had that experience where, you know, I've marked female on forms and then I get in there and I have to do all this explaining, right? Because the first questions that they ask me are going to be about, you know, can yeah. you be pregnant? Like, when was your period? How, you know, like all of these assumptions that that carries about your bodily functions. And for a lot of intersex people, that's just not how that works. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I, I have the same experience. Uh, every time I talk to an intake nurse, she's like, could you be pregnant? And I'm like, <laughs> um, okay, listen. Uh, and they usually insist on some explanation. So I've kind of started just saying like, look, I'm gay. Like, <laughs> we just need to start carrying some sort of like business card that says I am gay. Well, you have you have a hat that you wear that usually says it. I also have this tattoo. <laughs> Although you know, um, not all women have uh, you know certain genitals. Um, so very true, very true. That's important to to point out. And you touched on something. Yeah. I know it's also different for people who are both trans and intersex, right? Um, and yeah. we have a friend who is both a trans and intersex educator. Oh yeah, Madi. Um, do you think we should call them and see if they want to talk about this? I think, I think we should see, yeah, call them, see what they're up to. Okay, hold on. Hey, you two. Hey. So when it comes to the trans and the intersex experience, there are two misconceptions that people typically fall into. One being that trans and intersex people don't have any similarities whatsoever and that we only share differences between the two experiences. The other being that trans and intersex people interlocked and that our identities are so similar it's hard to tell them apart. Neither of these things are true. And what's more important is that there are people who are both intersex and trans. What we don't often think about when we think about trans healthcare is how trans intersex people can receive the same services. Often because of the way that our bodies differ from our endosex counterparts, it's hard for us to receive services like HRT, uh, top surgery, bottom surgery, what have you, without being coerced, uninformed, or pushed in a direction that we don't want to be pushed in. 
because our doctors often don't have a uh, comprehensive intersex education, some doctors who are considered trans friendly aren't intersex friendly and they don't have the same resources to help intersex trans people that we would expect. Hopefully that helps out a little bit. And if there's any more questions you guys have, feel free to give me another ring. We will. Thanks. Thanks. Wow, thanks, Marty. They are always a treasure trove of information. Oh yeah, I always love talking to them. I've had some friends who are both trans and intersex say that they had to kind of conceal their intersex status because it could have yeah. created more hurdles for them in trying to access gender affirming services. I've heard that from like at least three of my intersex and trans friends. Sometimes the doctor has like a preconceived notion of what your gender is or um, mm -hmm. something like that based on what they know your chromosomes are or something like that and right and it can be really frustrating they're like no i'm not giving you testosterone i think you're i think you're a girl so i'm going to give you only prescribe you estrogen um, right that's actually at least i've heard anecdotally that that can be the case for some people and i think that also points to the fact that so many of the health considerations that intersex people do face wouldn't have happened if they had not been intervened on in the first place at a young age. Absolutely, yeah. So we're um, talking about like hormonal stuff. So like if somebody had internal testes that were taken out sort of before they knew what was going on or hormone producing organs that were taken out, or, mm -hmm. you know, of course we talk a lot about um, the folks who've had genital surgeries that were not consensual. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that kind of a, that could be, uh, ties back with what you were saying with bones. Sometimes, if you're uh, if you're ha you have those gonads removed and you're not able to produce uh, hormones for yourself, your bones turn into jelly. Nobody likes Jello bones. Oh my God, that sounds like one of those heinous '90s products, like like purple ketchup. <laughs> Jello bones. It took me like eight months to find a doctor that had like, like I had a special uh, advocacy person at my insurance company working like all the time trying to find a doctor that had any experience treating intersex people. And it took wow. her like, I, I was like, I, I was like, she started getting really flustered and upset when she couldn't find one. And I was like, look, like, it's not your fault. It's not your fault. <laughs> There aren't any, don't worry about it. And then she did find one, but the experience that doctor had was pretty limited um, from the experience I had by, by going. So, you know, it's not always, you're not always gonna find someone who even knows what intersex is. That's like, I fe feel like a huge inequity, but also can be like life-threatening. That's, I feel like, been the, hallmark of my experience uh, of, of coming out has been finding that the community is doing this really, really hard work on um, making sure that intersex kids don't grow up in the same reality that we grew up in, where doctors are gaslighting us and uh, or, you know, surgering us when we're not consenting to it. And just, it feels like there's going to be hope for the future. I'm pretty optimistic. Yeah, me too. I think that's a good note to probably end on. What are you going to do um, for the rest of today? What, what is this, like day f day six, day seven? What's it, how's your day X of social distancing plan? I might play some piano or Mario Kart. Uh, I've been trying to video chat with as many people so that I don't feel so alone. Well, I really appreciate you having video chatted with me and shared all of this wonderful knowledge. Of course. Uh, it was lovely and thank you for including me. I will see you all next time. <laughs> Take care, friend. Good night. All right. Night. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for watching this episode. This episode was made possible by a grant from the Effing Foundation for Sex Positivity. Super grateful, lots of super cool stuff going on over there. So please go check them out. Hit all the buttons for me and I will see you next time.